For this uh, morning, the uh, lecture is going to be a continuation of Peter's uh, lecture from um, the previous days, and um, we're ready. There will be uh, questions uh, not during this. Uh, Peter's asked that we hold any questions we might have until he has finished uh, his lecture, and then at the end we can uh, ask whatever questions we want. Thank you. Two days ago, I started with discussing the hexagonal model, and um, I lost some time, admittedly, by finding out the level of the people in here. Um, now that that's established, I can um, confidently say we'll um, not skip the mathematics, which was my plan in the first instance. So I am not going to show you the rest of the slides that I missed, which th they were not that relevant. I will continue on discussing how the destabilization of interest rates is destabilization also of society. First we'll talk about the effects that this destabilization has on capital, but also labor of course. We'll discuss how uh, interest rates dropping are basically a bottomless pit. And in fact, I should start from the second. I don't know what happened there. We'll, we'll start from the, from the top here. The marginal productivity of capital, that's where we should start. And its relationship with the weighted average cost of capital. Now, weighted average cost of capital may mean something to most of you. That's why I'm making it, or I'm bringing it up. We, I'll discuss what uh, the difference is between low and falling interest rates, because that is important. How fiat money and artificial rates fit in, and what it actually does. This is the zest. This point is going to be important. How fiat money and dropping interest rates, what the mechanism is and how it exports industrial capital and its complement, the jobs that used to belong to the industrial capital. Tied in with that is where did the money go, because that was a question on the first day. <coughs> Another question that came up was speculation. We've seen that yesterday. It also ties in here. The role of speculation under the fiat system. Back to the effects of that on labor and capital. How dropping rates are bottomless pit. Why a weak dollar will not relate to higher interest rates. And vice versa. Um, and then a little bit of morality, which is always a contentious point in economics, because these are experiments with the welfare of the people. And um, these are words from Mr. Greenspan himself. In the past few days, we've seen how gold can be the cure, but it, it, it is, in fact, the cure for all the previous problems. <coughs> and then, in conclusion, I will come to this point. This so-called contra-cyclical financial policy, which is just a fancy word for money printing, is very counterproductive. In fact, it's destructive. Okay, here we go. Hitting you with uh, the marginal productivity of capital. As I said, the weighted average cost of capital will mean something to you. I will go over this very briefly. Um, what it means is, in fact, that the equity holders do need a certain return. And you weight that with the ratio of the equity on the total balance sheet or the total capital. You add to that the return that um, bondholders or banks, liabilities here, 
uh, and their return um, is also weighted, meaning that you get one weighted average. And for argument's sake, I simplify this um, as, as an interest rate represented by the symbol I. Now, in modern finance, not everybody uses the same methods to come to conclusions about investing or about uh, producing uh, or going with a project A, B, C, D, you know. But it is thought in modern finance that one should use correctly the net present value method. There are other methods. Uh, I still know people who say, all right, fine, this, call, this, this machine will cost, or this project will cost 100,000. Uh, I have 10 years, so 10, 100,000 divided by 10, I need at least 10,000 to break even every year. Yeah, uh, okay, that's it. Very simple. But of course it doesn't work. <coughs> the calculations are given here. In the first project, both projects are not the same, that is a real life situation also, um, not all projects are alike. So how do you compare them? Well, you estimate their cash flows. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because that is... You never know. How long will it last? Three years? Four years? Now, here's where the weighted average cost of interest, of cost of capital comes in, which is simplified, just the, the, the rate of return. And the calculations here. Um, on, on project A, we have a positive um, present value, 3,953 to be exact. And in the second project, one might think, uh, all right, this, this second project costs less, it yields more. So that must be more profitable, but that is, of course, after this calculation, obviously not. It, it, it yields negative. One should go for project A, although project B is cheaper and yields more. Both projects have different lifetimes and different <coughs> costs of capital. Project B looks tempting. It costs less and yields more per year, although it is only one year less than the other project. But, you know, if you don't do the calculation, that's how you fool. Now, marginal productivity of capital can be simply explained by the annualized percentage of, of change in added value, or if you want to put it simply, output minus your input. <coughs> And if you add up all your machinery, or if you add up all your projects, if you like, <coughs> some will do better than others. You can rank them. And after you rank them, this is how it would look like. <coughs> However, <coughs> after you rank them, you should weight them opportunity. <coughs> so when all use of your equipment in existence is weighted against opportunity cost, then it's easy to see that, that the opportunity costs, uh, which are represented here by the interest rate or the WAC, um, that the bottom ranking C and D are basically submarginal, they are negative. I know this is a very simple representation, but let's start simple. I know life is not so simple. And calculations uh, of net present value that I've just explained are more uh, difficult uh, for the freaks. This may be another calculation of net present value. All your projects are summed up. You take into account your tax rate, you take into account the actualization for your depreciation and your initial cost. You could also adjust for inflation. But, you know, it's anybody's guess what inflation is. 
I, I saw this question, but could you define your terms? Because I have difficulty following. Like, what do you mean by net present value? This is the total income over the life of the project? Yes. So that was, uh, thank you. Good question. Net present value means on its lifespan, you have certain cash flows. Your plant will actually yield something. It, it yields your income, hopefully. And the income of moment t to zero, if you want to make a decision on moment zero, which is now, you have to um, calculate back. What is that cash flow or these streams? <coughs> what are they worth right now? That's what it is. Net present value. And you use, of course, a certain um, discounting method. Okay, so the negative one is a loss. That's what the negative one yes. is. It is negative because you would be better off <coughs> simply put by putting your money in the bank instead of investing in the product. Okay, so you're putting in your uh, basic interest rate already, and that makes a difference. If the interest rate is low, you better off with your project. If the interest rate is high, you better off with a bond. Exactly. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so that is a small diversion. We'll not go too far into that. Um, there's complicated models that are taught at, at, at university level, which is not what we're discussing. I'm not here to discuss finance. I'm here to discuss the marginal productivity of capital. So, um, what is mar marginal productivity would be defined as, as the, the productivity of the last piece of equipment that is still acceptable, or that can be employed, uh, and the cutoff point that, 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 that lies somewhere is the last piece of equipment that can be employed without incurring a loss, which is under the yellow line. So project A and B can be employed, C and D would, you would incur a loss. So uh, another point here, important here, is that the cutoff point that is not rigid Uh, in fact, you may have two identical pieces of equipment, each costing a million. Your costs of finance would be in project A 6%, both you have a lifespan of 10 years. But out of the cash flow, if you have financed this at 6%, that's the point in time where you enter, you decide, you sign on the dotted line, 60,000 will have to come out of your cash flow, reducing your profitability. Plant B, exactly the same machine, exactly the same circumstances, just to make a comparison. Otherwise, we cannot compare apples with pears, of course. But um, this is um, either you with a second plant or your competitor going into the market at another time uh, of at another time and financing lower. Yeah. His weighted average cost would be lower, 5%. And his costs of financing this project will only be 50,000, coming out of the same cash flow. Simplified, he may have a different cash flow, but you know, to simplify, this is the difference, 10,000. Obviously, if you have falling interest rates and you got in too early, and the other one, came now, I mean, you're at a disadvantage immediately. That is the um, zest of the argument here. here. Uh, my concern here is that we've got 45 minutes left. That's why I'm taking the next slide. Okay, thank you. Other, <laughs> the free market producers are, of course, price takers. They have no pricing power, and therefore your margin is cut. You, 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 you are squeezed. You are squeezed. Life is not that simple. You may have other advantages, you may have a better product, you may have cutting edge technology, you may have brain power, but eventually it will catch up with you. You cannot hold that forever. Now, here's the difference between low rates and falling rates. At first glance, this looks like a falling interest rate is good. Wow, project C and D are now profitable. <laughs> Don't be fooled. 
They are profitable for your opponent. You are invested at an earlier time, at, a, at an earlier time, and he's later in dropping rates. He's you, you have an opportunity, cost. Don't be fooled by this. Your project C and D, which you have decided against in the first instance, are now profitable for your opponent and he's going with it because of dropping rates and you missed out. That is the point of this slide. So, you know, when I started studying this, I thought, oh, this is confusing. Well, what is this? Ah, you know, project C and D are, you know, until it hit me. Of course, this is not for me because I've already entered the market. The opponent is entering the market now with lower rates. And for the time being, he has an advantage because he will become me after a while when, drops, when rates drop further. And his opponent is going into the market at even lower rates. But rates are fluctuating. We should, I mean, I know that life is not that linear. So. Um, we have seen under the hexagonal model, under a gold standard, that the ceiling and the floor are decided by market participants. Interest rates do fluctuate, but not very much. Therefore, if your interest rate under a gold standard drops, <coughs> your weighted average cost of capital, you may have a disadvantage, but it's mild because these fluctuations will revert and it's temporary. In fact, the floor under gold standard is dominant. If the floor interest rate drops, it is very temporary, it will revert back. The ceiling, however, will stay uh, more permanent. I haven't been able to um, counter that, but it, it is not so important. You can find that, in fact, in, in, in uh, the writings of, of Professor Fichetti. So, currently, with all uh, the whole world on a fiat monetary system, central banks decide on, like we've seen yesterday, the short-term interest rate. Now, because of the mechanism of borrowing short and lending long, they manipulate the long rates also. And as you can see, they're coming down. This, this is biased, in a way. Not linear, obviously. But it is this, this, this standard economic doctrine for this, uh, whatever they call it, contra-cyclical money injection. And, and everybody knows how the system works of contra-cyclical money injection. Should I go into that? Yeah, please. Yeah. All right. It is simply done by a central bank who decides to drop interest rates. Ben Bernanke or Mr. Greenspan saying, right, rates are announced to be dropped. Boom, 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 he decided against the market forces of the hexagonal model. Now, what makes everybody listen to him? Listen to him? Well, um, you know, he's usurped the power simply as that. But the mechanism used is that they are now buying, meaning they are printing the money, and buying them in the market. And they're buying the bonds, driving up prices. And if you, buy, if you drive up prices, you, that interest rate on that bond comes down. With this effect, then of course, um, the holder of the older bond, who yields in this example 6%, which is, you know, for example, 60,000 a year, and I've used, I've used the example of a perpetuity here, you know, you, you can or you may substitute it for another, it doesn't matter. But if interest rates drop from 6%, do the calculations after me, if you like, to 
yielding 30,000, the holder of the first one, the 6% one, will have a capital gain. Now, Professor Fichetti writes somewhere that it's 2 million. He, he, he obviously rounded it off. The exact calculation is 1 million 999. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, that is 2 million. And as you can see in that long graph, it doesn't take all that long to drop to, to, to half rates. So the older, the first older, doubles his money. And who holds those bonds? <laughs> well, you and I may have one, but your bank will probably have a few hundred or a few thousand. What they fail to tell you is that they are getting rich on the night. Now they have a little bit of own capital, if you look at the balance sheet of the bank, they have this much own capital and they have that much other people's money, your money, with which they buy bonds before the bank, central bank announces an interest rate drop. Holding that older bond, and afterwards they sell it, killing, making a killing in the process, and I'm telling you, they will give you how much on your savings? Good news, friends, whatever. You're lucky to get four. This is what your friendly banker will not tell you. Of course, they're graduate students who do not. But there, your friendly banker will tell you another story. How much costs have increased? Yeah, yeah. 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 So this is the mechanism um, that is known and that is used uh, to put interest rates into a falling mode and bonds obviously in an upward mode. Remember yesterday? Minority both interest rates down and Yields, yields down and, and, and your bond hold will make it This is the speculation. <laughs> so in this lecture, in fact, we repeat and we <coughs> get it all. Now, um, it's, it's obvious that ever since, um, I'm taking all these examples, since 1981, where interest rates were 18%, uh, it, it is predictable what central banks will do, they will use this fancy word contracyclical monetary experience. Contracyclical and what came up with that word? <laughs> that is that is such a euphemism for for uh, money printing. And, and that, that is supported students as as standard uh, economic monetary policy. Uh, this is what we do, this is how we manage the world. And it is explained um, that it is used to support price structures. And here it comes again, price structures. They want to control prices. Instead of, instead of the well, they, they control prices for by interest rate. But they have a fixation on prices. <coughs> so I've shown you that mathematically every time um, the rates are halved, the first bondholder's capital doubles. It's as simple as that. And that is the zest of the argument. Central banking has this, this policy which creates an obvious bias. The bias is for the bondholders, but even, even that is, is a euphemism for speculators. Because your friendly speculator is not you and me, that's your bank, your hedge fund. Certain institutions who have a bond portfolio also, they know. You know, after the second time this has happened to them, or after the first time, if they're very smart, they find out. Hmm, nice. That is speculation. If you are planning on getting rich overnight, just keep your bond, keep keep that government bond, which was sold to you at you know at eighteen percent. That you are rich by now. And the professor said that some point in time, some of these papers, the Chinese are probably sitting on a very large stack of those bonds. So um, their wallet of uh, foreign exchange 
is probably in large part due to that as well on the bonds they were holding from the beginning, from the 80s. They're not stupid. <coughs> right, now we come to the difficult part because it is obvious that um, this mechanism of, of open market purchases of bonds is inflating the bond market. It's inflating the bond market. We are in this cycle. This bond market is growing, growing exponentially, including the derivatives. Now, this is of course shrinking because the money grows this way. We are obviously in a deflationary period. That's where we are now. That's why I'm having difficulty in believing that we are in a full commodity world. Certain items will be, you know, life is not strictly left or right, up or down, certain items like gold and silver are in the commodity world. Oil also. But the rest of the world is in a deflationary spiral. Yes, yes. But we can't, you, you may make your objection <laughs> at the end. Does that mean there's a bond ball of cost for a bond ball? Sorry? Does that mean that if the bond ball is a pop, it will automatically drive a commodity ball? It's not going to pop. It will, it will deflate. Yeah. And and deflate. Yes, well, a small, I mean, this is like quadrillions. A small dent in here will make this, this commodity. I mean, it's a small amount of money going into the gold and silver market. Com compare, it, compare the gold and silver market to the bond market in order of magnitude. It's this to that. So, so if we are seeing a gold market, ball, you know, all right, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think generally, because it may, it may uh, 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 uptrend in the bond prices and, and yields. Yeah. I mean, there's a many percent of the on from the many years yes. of yields coming down and lowering and lowering and lowering. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Generally, generally, people think that if interest rates rise, the US dollar will get stronger and it will go on and be damaged. But there is also a point under what you're saying here where uh, interest rates will rise at a global advantage. And if, if that occurs under the scenario where bonds are being sold in preference for gold, therefore interest rates will rise and gold will rise. I'm not so sure if interest rates will rise. Okay. I mean, if the bond holders do start selling. Yes, should it happen? Should it happen? The bond holders will be good position because they're losing them fast. Yeah, yeah. That's that's when they start selling, <laughs> catching in. If they start, if they ever sell their bonds. And, and, and that, if, if this is a balloon, you know, and, and, and I'm holding a pin, yeah. that's, well, I don't want to make it a popping sound because that's also not. It, it will deflate, but rather fast. Okay. Uh, by spooks, bond holders, of course. And depends on who's holding them. The marginal holder will be the first one. Of course, this is where the money goes. Money goes into the bond market. That is created. It's debt money created and it flows to the bond market. The central bankers are hoping that the money they create flows to the commodity market. Ha ha. Surprise, surprise. Some of it does. Some of it goes into mortgages. Some of it goes into loans to businesses. But I mean, if you compare the sizes, nominal sizes. You just said the fact that money created by the central bank, they want this money to go into the commodity market. But central, central bankers hope, because they also see what is happening. They're not stupid. So I'm not saying that. Um, no, but they are hoping. They are hoping that the money. Money to see the commodities market. They are hoping it's 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 flowing into the commodities. Yes. Really. Because they create deflation, and they know, and they hope to buy by stoking some fire into inflation. They hope to create some inflation to put out deflation. Yeah. And that is. 
Sorry? When there is deflation, yes. But understand. But at the moment, we're not in the at, at, at the moment, well, we should have definitions of inflation and deflation. This is inflation and deflation, in my opinion, when prices of, of, of everyday life are, are going up and down. Um, I would call it, you know, let's, let's define it differently because otherwise we're going to confuse the issue. Prices are going up also by the perverse side effect of money burning in your hand, losing value, which is another side effect. But that is not a point of discussion here. That is an entirely side, other side effect, compounding the problem, of course, confusing the issue. And that's why they want to create some inflation to put up deflation, and it's not working. Because I don't think they understand is there a, that system. Is there a limit? This, this mega, mega downturn in years, is there not a limit where the, 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 the manipulation that the banks have on the bond market goes, can go no further? What is there? Do bondholders look at the true inflation rate and say to themselves, oh, I don't care if the Fed continues to lower rates? It's not going to benefit in the end. Is there ever a point where the bondholders will reach the, the limit where manipulation will no longer help them? You mean by manipulation? Bias, the, the bias that we talked about yeah. previously. But that bias will, will no longer be effective for them. It won't help them. It, and, 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 and. I think the answer to that would be psychology. And the short is, I don't know. The long is, well, we have two ways. If, if society um, decides they're going with the central bankers, we're ending up in a black hole of zero interest. It could also go the other way, and then we end up in a hyperinflationary, a hyperinflationary scenario. So either we go down very fast with the negative rates which you already have are we going to a black a black hole zero and negative interest rate looks at look at the Japan it can get you know if you think it, it, it can't get worse it will the other side is you know we're going to hyperinflation which has happened before I mean both are equally destructive and that is again we're coming back to these oscillations which are getting bigger every time now you know it's everybody's guess. We've never seen this before. Short answer, I don't know. But maybe the professor can comment on that afterwards. Maybe he has, he has had 30 years to think about this and I've only had a week. <laughs> right. Um, this is a dooming picture and um, this is, this is the main point. This is where we should spend uh, a few moments, and I still have some time left. So the point I want to make is there is a difference between low rates, which are stable under a gold standard, and falling, gyrating rates going all over the place, spoo spooking investors, because they need, uh, you know, they have personal need to invest into their own ideas, their own livelihoods. But they're constantly faced with marginal opportunity, uh, with, with opportunity costs. And if you're um, a financial uh, capitalist, um, you, you'd be well advised to stay in the bond market, for obvious reasons that we've seen. So these, 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 these falling rates and these gy gyrating rates um, are not very helpful um, to the entrepreneur. Now, um, I've presented that argument to some very smart people and also to um, the rest of some of you and I will jump <laughs> I, prefer, I prefer to put them to smart people <laughs> and they came with the objection yeah well why don't you refinance <laughs> That's good. why don't you refinance um, <clears throat> I thought of that you know well, oh, hang on, that's a good idea, at first sight. This is what happens when you refinance. You go to your friendly banker, and you have this mortgage, and he will welcome you with open arms, 
sure we can refinance, but remember the mathematical formula. He's well versed in He knows he's giving you a loan in return for cash flows. This is the amount of the loan he gives you. You've signed on the dotted line. And if you come to him for a refinancing, he's losing. You're asking him to shoot himself in the foot. And if he says, yes, I will, think again. What's he going to do? He's going to fool you. He's going to make this a bit longer. <laughs> or something of the other. He's, he's got a lot of factors that he can play with. Now, you can do that with your ordinary household person. You cannot fool financial people who know this. So they sell the idea in a different way. Wall Street has come up with another more difficult package and they will sell you a contract on your project. Factory A, B, C, you remember? And they will sell you a contract with put options in it. If you want to get out, for a small premium, we can do this variable rate for you. And you think, hmm, yeah, sure, that sounds good. But there's a premium. There's a premium, Jason. Rates make rates jump all over the place. In a band, they jump all over the place, but generally going down. So this may probably I mean put options are very volatile. And they're giving you only a year or two years. Very risky. Very risky. I don't like good options. I don't like options that only use you know six months to a year. I prefer long-term options. But they come at a massive price. Not worth your while. So um, the other objection was, and I was stunned at first when, when, when the professor told me this, not this, not Professor Fikete, my own professor in, in, in Brussels. And his answer was, why would you invest in marginal projects? And at first I thought, well, there is a smart answer. Indeed, I won't. Simple as that, I won't. <laughs> he was right. But he was actually blaming me, you know, why are you, why are you investing in marginal projects? No, of course I won't. I'm going to China. <laughs> Simple as that. However, going to China, if you think about it, won't help. Because the same problem holds you over there. Eventually. Yeah, it's a matter of time. You can go and invest on a massive project at the back of the moon, at a long distance, but it will haunt you. And it will dawn on you that you didn't, that you better didn't invest in a project unless it's very, very good yielding. Because otherwise you would be better off with a bond. So you need to be an extremely good entrepreneur. And that also buy, that buys you time and enough time, probably a lifetime. Now, there's, there's a difficult part. <coughs> what I'm presenting here is of course a, a very um, condensed argument and a simplified argument. Life is different. You can be out, you can outsmart and outrun uh, by having very clever projects, and you have only you, you're the only one with the technology, and you're the first one, so the rest is running behind you. Yes, yes, you will have an advantage. That project will definitely not be a marginal project. That will not be a marginal project, that that would would be be project really but out of, out of millions of of, uh, of of bankruptcies every year, there's also millions of people thinking I have the next yeah. egg of Columbus. Yeah, that is because most solutions are hallucinations. Big was all No argue about that, but um, <coughs> that's that's where life. And this is where you end up. There. Yeah. Because at the moment, you know, once invested, you are not a financial capitalist anymore. You are an industrial capitalist. And at one point in time you realize Darn, I sh better off putting my money in bonds because I can't keep up. So you stop 
maintaining your plant, you stop maintaining it, you stop writing down, and you stop cutting the grass and replacing the windows, and that's where it ends up. I know it's simple, but in the end, that is what falling interest rates will do to the industrial capitalist. Not the financial capitalist, because he's growing rich in bonds. Nominally, that is, I'm not saying in reality, nominally. I'm not saying that one million becomes two million and you can buy the same. That's, an, that's a different issue, that, that, that is a subject for another course. This is the argument, it is absolutely central banking policy, uh, conventional central banking policy, is distorting the market. And it is distorting it badly. Uh, you may look at some statistics. And other, uh, and other objections, because I mean, when a factory closes, industrial capital closes down, there's two, there's another party who loses. What about the jobs of the people that work there? Gone. If capital loses, so do the people. And I had another objection. Mr. Van Koppen said, look at our employment statistics, we're short of labor. And I had to admit, yes, we, uh, we are having a little problem, we're short of people. But then if you look closer, ever since this, this, this process has been going on, Laborers and farmers have been reduced, the primary sector, and it, it's been growing in favor of the secondary and later on the, what is called the tertiary sector. And if you look at the tertiary, tertiary sector right now, what is in it? It is for, for a part these smart entrepreneurs and, and, and what have you, but for a large part these people are employed by the financial sector. So, I'm talking here about people employed by the central bank. And I can tell you with confidence, the university where I am is right next to the Brussels Central Bank. That building is five times bigger than the university and it employs 2,000 people. 2,000. What are they all counting? Money? What do they do? That, that is the Brussels Central Bank, which is a small bank. I mean, imagine the ECB in Frankfurt, how many people are working there? I, uh, well, and that is only one country, we are now with 27. Oh, I don't know, I've lost count. Growing or giving me, giving me the uh, conviction that this financial system is in fact a parasite. And it feeds the parasite. I'm not saying that the people at the central bank are parasites, but I don't want to insult anyone. The system is, yeah. It's just the system that makes it possible. They may be productive in their own mind, but in the end, if it wasn't for this financial system, they would be doing something else, productive. Also, remember the exact model. But because of gyrating interest rates, basically the system steals from the entrepreneur because you know he loses money and in the end you know this is not without loss huh? scrapping industrial capital he's, he's, he's incurred losses and at one point he cut his losses and, and run but the losses are ending up not on the balance sheet of the banks but on the income statements and especially the expenditure statements because now they, 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 they you know that's where the money is spent on their salaries mr bernanke has a salary who pays that Probably the entrepreneur, yeah. with his losses. The important point here that I want to make is that even when interest rates revert higher, you would say, all oh, right, oof, I'm out of the woods. You know, interest rates aren't dropping anymore, they're going back up. 
No, it doesn't work that way. Because your money has been invested, you cannot get out of it without costs. You cannot reverse your positions without costs. What is needed for an entrepreneur, therefore, is a stable rate, within fluctuating within safe margins that he can absorb. But not wild gyrations coming from 18 going down to probably negative rates. And then it will, then the bubble will burst, and you know, the first one who smells a rat will be out, and then uh, others will follow. We are probably the first rats to smell. <laughs> we are the first ones to smell a rat. <laughs> Good. Now let's get on with it because we have a little bit of time left. Where did this capital go? Simply, I've already explained. Financial capital has better gone into the bond market. They have. Uh, they know where they have to put their money. And the industrial capital, well, they've made a move to the east. Don't blame the Chinese, don't blame the sweatshops, they have been there always. Even under stable rates, that at that time it didn't make a difference. Because the industrial capitalists in the Western European Union or in the Western Hemisphere, in Australia or in, in a developed country, he could absorb, he had no need to move. He stayed, he could absorb that. Now he can't, so he's moving shop. We've already discussed the impact on capital, fun, uh, not financial capital, but on, on industrial capital. Please consider labor also. We all work here, people. Either we work for ourselves, but we can also work for a factory. There's a uh, majority of the population um, are laborers. And they are, in fact, the main, the main victims of this system, unwittingly. Interest rates, meaning also your weighted average cost of capital, the web, they can be halved, they can always be halved, that's, that's a mathematical function, it's, it's simple. Um, central bankers are um, competing with, with, with bond speculators, which means your bank, your hedge fund, and between them they make they make the interest rate fall, of course, and to this fall there is no mathematical um, no mathematical halt. There may be a psychological halt, but mathematically you can keep on cutting them. It's an asymptotical function. Now, also a little bit of mathematics, well, it should be observed that, that um, um, there's no bottom to this fall because um, the move in interest rate is in fact related, um, commensurate in fact with the move, not, not with the move itself but with its logarithm. It's, it's a lot of, it should be read on a logarith logarithmic scale. They can, but, but in 1971 the trend going up. Yeah. So, even though there is uh, no mathematical limit to how, how many times they can reduce rates, there must be some other kind of limit where they where the trend something changes the trend. It, are you are you trying to uh, find a mathematical to solution to how high will it go or how low will it go? The 
because of the long term change. I mean, Maybe there's no mathematical solution to that. Maybe it's, that's a philosophical solution. Well, it's kind of answered by that, um, the, the protest panic. Yes. It's anybody's guess. Mm. This is this is where the alpha male in the lemon herd will, you know, determine the course. When, when there's enough people reversing the course, that's when the seesaw reverses. Is it when? No, I'm sorry to say one more. Yesterday, the gene of the also explains it crystal clear, so it's not that complicated. No. When the interest is too low, that no one invests in bonds anymore, something happens, and this is not financial capital. That's exactly what happens now, since 2001. Mm -hmm. And the market forces, according to the exit amount model, they are pressuring liquidity everywhere, not only in commodities, inflation is forces and coming back because the movement of commodities, so the interest rate has to go up as it works, as it works in time, as the professor yesterday, and with mm -hmm. the external model in the nice visualization, clearly confirmed. So it's yep. a system like that. Okay. They can't go to zero, but when it's zero, okay, then you just bring for nothing. And the financial community is smart, they want to be rich, but they don't want to have only payments, they want to make money. And yeah. that explains it for me. Yeah. When interest rates are for too long and not too low, then you have to do something. The pressure of the market causes big to come, and they are there. And then interest starts to rise. Yeah. Till the ceiling is uh, from the floor to the ceiling, while the variations, then under all stuff, which would be very good, yes. Mm -hmm. But the uh, system works exactly like okay. that, just in a quite destructive, because wild things up and down. Exactly. So the no. equilibrium theory will will decide put the pressure mm -hmm. on the central bank to prevent them from continuing forever. The, the, the old bonds make you rich. The new bonds need to be sold. And the new bonds are sold with interest. So this interest is too low for an opportunity investment that even the states have difficulties to sell them to the Chinese, Japanese, or themselves at the end of the day. And that is somewhat a regulatory effect, which yes. you can see also on this long term chart. Because it's actually, the interest rate should already go much higher. Yes. Just because the states are in such a shangle as a whole economy that keeps the bad back, back because okay. they have to do something very drastic and don't forget it was part of 25 just one year ago. Nominal rates are too low yeah. because they're already negative. negative real rates. Real rates I, mean, I mean, if you think about it, real rates and nominal rates should be a lot higher. Now, don't bet against the central bank. I won't. Mm. But I have more four more slides to go. We will, I think we should discuss this thoroughly. Please let me, you know, I mean this, the main point has been made. Um, but I'll finish this and then we'll have five five minutes of uh, discussion and even we can discuss this a lot longer. Um, what I wanted to say is this can be a bottomless pit because um, we can go into zero uh, negative rates we, and we already are. Um, it is possible. Japan is an example. There is this argument about traditional, um, well, traditional economics teaches, you know, traditional economics teaches us that um, a weak dollar would prevent U.S. interest rates from falling. But um, that objection is obviously uh, a non-issue. It, 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 one doesn't it, it, that doesn't follow. It's a non-sequitur because, as you can see, the paradox is already in place. A falling dollar, as we know now, does coexist with falling rates. So, I mean, whatever traditional economics is telling us that weak dollar doesn't coexist with uh, dropping rates is what it is. Pox. Pox. And I've never heard anybody comment on that, you know. They, they seem to have forgotten their argument. So what is, what is thought that cannot happen in real life uh, is, is, is there for everybody, everybody to, 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 to witness. And also what, you, what can happen overnight with competing devaluations. You know, this, this, this weak dollar all of a sudden becomes a strong dollar. <laughs> you know, only for... Um, a week later to become a weak dollar again and a strong 
yen or whatever. Ugh, it's you know, it's it's silly to try and put this this uh, into into an econometric model. I mean, you're just chasing your tail. I've shown this yesterday briefly, um, and I'm going to uh, slowly close here. It is Mr. Greenspan who stated in public at a certain point in time that uh, it is the Fed's combat plan uh, against deflation um, that is put that has been put in place, and that is experimental. He used that word experimental, and it's never happened in history before that uh, the nation was confronted by um, by deflation under the fiat money regime. So this, this reasoning of him um, cannot, cannot be rationally explained. What is he doing? It's, it seems that there must be a flaw in this traditional doctrine that has never been debated before. Um, why is he using experiments on you and me? With obvious consequences. Obvious to Professor Fikete, to us, apparently not to them, or maybe, well, maybe obvious to them also, maybe it's by design, who knows, but I cannot read their mind. So, um, for the moment I think they don't know, until it's proven that they do know very well what they are doing and that it is by design. If it is by design, shame on them, because they are literally bankrupting the world. Are these the new masters of the universe? Are they playing at games like that? I don't know. Gold is the cure. We've discussed this in the hexagonal model, the floor and the ceiling, both determined by two different market forces. It enforces discipline, but it will put a few thousand of employees at the ECB and at the Central Bank and at the Federal Reserve. Am I saying thousands? Probably tens of thousands of people out of business. Aww. Shame on them, they have to go back to their garden and grow their own vegetables. Um, too bad, but look, that's the system. They've they don't, probably don't know the parasites, but uh, that's how it works. That's how it is. It, in fact, gold is, is like God's eye and God's revenge. I'm not very religious, although we are here in a place where one should keep your composure. Um, but I would like to swear out loud at fear one. Really, I should. And I conclude with this, that, that both um, capitalists and labor, if you, can, if you can contrast them, because there's a lot of labor with, with, with some money as well, the hexagonal model makes us all of it. Uh, but, you know, to make your argument simple, um, both capital and labor they have a vested interest in returning to the gold standard. And I'm not sure if they understand. Well, they should. I mean, there's a very, very convincing argument against um, fiat money. I think fiat money is, in fact, modern slavery, which was abolished in which, what century was it? Yeah. The 18th century? Yeah. And they devised a new system of slavery. But it is my personal interpretation and maybe getting carried away. Okay. So in conclusion, this, this whole contra-cyclical euphemism, you know, whatever they use and teach at graduate students as gospel, it's obvious, counterproductive. You can see it in this long wave chart. It is the Kondratiev wave, which, by the way, did not exist Previous before this, well, it, it, it has existed a little bit, but I mean, this is a idealized uh, conductive wave. You can see the blue line here, which are the, the, the U.S. Uh, Treasury bond uh, 
yields, the yields are not the prices, the prices would be inverse. And look how, look how stable they were between 1800 and, and basically um, 1875, the blue line. And then they start gyrating. Damn, damn. This is the oscillating power we've been discussing, or, or the professor has been discussing. And it's getting out of hand. So this is my conclusion. Um, this system does not work and it has no right of existence either. Thank you. Next session, uh, we'll start later. We have, we have time for questions now. Um, I would like to thank you, Peter, for shedding more light on the professor's work here. Because that's really what this is. It's an iteration of uh, the professor's law of study of the basis of the economics and, and, and drawing these things out when you, I mean, the realization that the apparent polarities of capital and labor upon which wars and conflicts have been fought are only apparent. And in truth, there's, the interests of capital and labor are joined. Because under the fiat money system, both both are damaged in the long term. And the capitalists have thought that the fiat money system was to their advantage. And now the realization at the end of the system is that it will become apparent that it's not. And I think this is your presentation you know, about the you know, an obvious point. So we will come together again. And uh, this has been a very, very good session. Thank you.